So in this case, I'll go into a little bit more detail about what I think this representation will probably have to look like. The principle um, 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 goes as follows. Um, proportionately, there will be five African or Asian states. That will be three from Asia, two from Africa. At least one Eastern European state, two Latin American states, and two Western European or other states. This, these mathematics might appear um, arbitrary, um, but I do think that um, existing principles and existing practices will be the way to start when thinking about getting a new initiative off the ground. And um, this um, breakdown and um, um, this equation is the equation that's used when um, um, when the General Assembly is deciding which states to elect as new members to the UN Security Council. It's where in the 70 odd years of practice of it, um, the UN, um, I would suggest it will be the place to start when we're thinking about um, the type of support that would make the citizens initiative legitimate in the eyes of the UN. You also need to think about the absolute level of support from for example, each state or each region, and you probably also need to think about an overall number of signatures um, as a certain percentage of the, of the global uh, population. Uh, I did say I was going to keep my remarks to questions of law level, and that seems to me to be uh, a question of politics part, part so on. The, the final stage then will be what would the citizens' initiative actually be expecting of, of the UN? Clearly, as Daniela um, quite rightly said, this would have to be a non-binding um, um, initiative. Uh, it, 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 it simply wouldn't fly that it, as soon as the initiative met the required number of signatories, it was therefore adopted as, for example, a, a new international um, treaty. And it would be therefore important to manage expectations of the campaigners, and these expectations need to be carefully managed and communicated. I think that the UN General Assembly will be the most appropriate um, institution um, to, to have the matter discussed on their agenda. According to Article 10 of the UN Charter, the General Assembly can discuss any matter um, under the competence of the UN. The General Assembly is essentially a sort of debating chamber, a forum for the exchange of ideas and the discussion of, of a wide variety of, of problems. Um, its decisions are not legally binding, but it does have the power to pass resolutions the member states are at least politically expected to, to respond to. And the General Assembly is importantly for, in this context, the General Assembly is in a position to launch intergovernmental negotiations under the UN that might lead towards a new, a new treaty. There's a number of different avenues that we might explore in terms of um, how exactly to get the matter on the, um, up to the General Assembly's um, attention and for matters of time. I won't discuss these, but again, I'll be happy to, to discuss it in question. Instead, I'd just like to, um, to, to conclude with, with four um, particular areas of challenge that the, um, sort of, um, the campaigners would probably like to think about moving forward. Um, the first one is the question of, of scale. With, with a global constituency of some 7.7 billion people, this question of scale has always been the sort of the, the hurdle um, that has meant that going all the way to sort of fully fledged global direct democracy um, but nobody has really taken that, that step yet. This, this is not an unsurmountable hurdle but considering the problems that we see in direct democracy at the domestic and regional level, the question of scale is a challenge that we shouldn't lose sight of. The second challenge is the nature of international law itself. Individuals are seen to be objects of international law. International law gives us rights, it gives us obligations, but we're seen as passive subjects of the law as opposed to active um, agents. Um, I think Article 25 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights would be the legal avenue towards sort of rethinking this proposition. Um, Caroline quite rightly um, this afternoon said um, democracy is a, is a human right. I think this will be the sort of legal principle that establishes, establishes this, this human right. Um, the citizen's right to political participation in Article 25 of the ICCPR. The third challenge would be the nature of the UN itself, you know, intergovernmental. Um, um, international organisations are, are made by and, and for states. But there is a long and increasing practice of allowing um, NGOs and other members of civil society to participate as non-voting non participants on the General Assembly and the Security Council. 
Um, Article 71 of the UN Charter provides a specific um, consultative status for, for NGOs in um, the um, Economic and Social Council. So this will be the way to surmounting that hurdle, but it's still a hurdle that we shouldn't, that we shouldn't lose sight of. Finally, the final challenge is the um, continued dominance of a certain small number of states within the UN. And simply getting a matter to the attention of the General Assembly will not necessarily surmount that final hurdle. It's important to be under no disillusions about the magnitude of these legal hurdles. But as I said, our conclusion is they're not necessarily insurmountable. In fact, supporters and campaigners, uh, of which you can now count me amongst you, amongst your number, should take heart from both the genuine ingenuity of the idea, but also its relative modesty. Right, the, the aim is not to, to reinvent how international law works. The aim is to find a new and important way for individual citizens to have a voice. Um, in matters that are discussed at the highest, um, the highest um, institution of global politics. Um, campaigns should also take heart from the continued maturity of the European Citizens Initiative, and for all of its influence, for all of its complexities, for all of its near universal membership. The UN was established as, and continues to operate as, an international organisation, just as the European Union. The ECI should, should serve as a template the real challenges, therefore, are not legal, and if the idea of the Citizens' Initiative is to be upscaled, these challenges exist in geopolitics and in advocacy. So this lawyer should sign up. Wouldn't such an initiative cause people to become, to see the deficits and become disappointed rather than feeling hurt? Is this a great danger, and how do you think to be put off coming with this step? Yeah, um, so this is a little bit the problem with the ECI, right? Is that um, the uh, expectation management is not there um, because it's not a, a binding tool. And when campaigners go out on the streets and collect signatures, that's not always um, made so clear. So sign this, uh, and the commission will take this up. Life of state will be banned in the EU if you sign this. That didn't happen. And then people are, of course, this point. I mean, um, the commission has also not really responded in a way that does justice to the to all the, the work of the campaigners. Um, but I think the point that Ben made, really, expectation management is number one here. Um, but it's really, how do we want to use this tool? So, uh, like I said, I think, from my point of view, it's really to raise awareness um, on these different types of issues. Uh, and, you know, it's really, it, I think what the ECI is good in doing is that it inspires legislation. I think this is a word maybe we use more than it sets the agenda. You know, these but I think that we can use citizens' initiatives like the ECI, the agenda setting ones, in a way to inspire legislation. So, um, I mean, in the end, it will be really member states that carry it out. And sometimes with the ECI, the, the biggest success stories have been at the member state level. That, um, that member states have have taken an ECI idea, whether it was successful or not, have taken it and run with it. And that's actually sometimes the success of it. And um, sometimes this is where the steps go. We cannot always, um, we cannot launch big. This is a bold idea, of course, um, but I think it's a good way to inspire and then change on a certain type of topic, whatever the, the issue might be. So it's a good way to, I think, set the scale to have a, um, the institutional framework that there is a tool that exists at the international level that we could use and then it can inspire legislation at different levels. Then it becomes maybe at the member state level and we see where it goes from there. But that's also where the success of the ECI really lies. I, I, I would like to add just a small side note to that. Um, because what what you say is this dissolution in, in the United Nations and this it is already taking place. Um, it, it, it is this, this disappointment, this process, it is already taking place, um, and so the only the only way to um, to prevent this from flip, from slipping further is is to change things and to, to democratize and to re revitalize the, the UN. Um, and as Daniela mentioned before, and, and this is maybe really um, something important, there is or there are already many initiatives going on, um, and and they are they are bundling under the under the the hat of UN twenty twenty. Um, ahead of the, the 75th anniversary of the UN, there's really a big push um, for, for renewing um, the UN and strengthening the UN and, and democratizing it. Um, and, and I think if the UN would run with it, if they take it up and run with it, it would, it 
would have the opposite effect, but that's what we hope. You know, I, I just want to say something about that, that in essence, the UN is, is not a very effective organization in all kinds of ways, for all kinds of obvious reasons. And part of what the UN does is to put things on the agenda or send a, a moral statement to the world. And so, you know, I think there will be disappointment. And it's, I don't think it's so bad for people to realize that the UN is a paper tiger. And, and in some ways, I think if it was a paper tiger, people might, might also be concerned. But any way to get things on the agenda or to bring up issues is a good thing. And I, and I think Ben's right that you have to, uh, and you know, you know, everybody realizes you have to manage expectations. But I wouldn't overly worry about that in the sense that when I first looked at the ECI, I wrote a column about it, and it, it's just so weak. And then I realized, but well, we have nothing like that at the federal level, the national level in the United States, and I would kill, I shouldn't say that, <laughs> but, but if, you know, as a figure of speech, I'd do anything to have something like that. In other words, it's not everything we want, but it is a, a, a real something. Practically, do you, have or do you perceive that you have any country support for this? Right now, we're trying to plan. It, well, it's it's in the talks now. We're planning um, a briefing on this at the UN in New York, and there are three uh, UN missions who are on board. Not that they totally endorse the idea, but they're willing to host it, um, and so they're willing to have a discussion. And that's the missions of Malaysia, Canada, and of course our friends in Switzerland. So um, we at least we know that there that those three are there, and I mean I can imagine many more. Like how we said the the um, UN 2020 agenda, this will really be our way to get our foot in the door because this is where the big discussion on the revision of the UN will be taking place. I think um, a lot of these member states will have their ears and eyes open, um, maybe for some ideas, so they can, of course, I mean take some ideas forward, so they can get the pat on the back. But I think there really is a discussion now. Um, how to uh, fix the image of the UN a bit, and something like this, which is it's not legally binding, I mean, it would be a perfect way to fix the image up of the UN a bit. Um, and uh, of course, I mean, it would, the effect that it would have, that the citizens would have an actual voice, um, it would be brought to the literal international scale is also amazing to think about. But the support? The support is there at least in three countries. And, uh, and of course, the idea of this event with the three countries is to get more countries on board. Mm -hmm. It's a really interesting point. If it uh, raised, where because when we talk about the sort of the, the legal obligations of business actors, say, and whether they violate fundamental human rights or or elements of world trade law, or whether states develop um, weapons of mass destruction, these are all um, issues that are already regulated by various parts of, of international law. So states have these obligations, states and non-state actors have these obligations. So that would seem to me to be an argument in favour of establishing an, 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 an initiative such as this because it would, it, it would potentially draw to, to the attention of uh, the UN and by extension um, other member states that these um, principles are, are being um, violated. So to counter all of these problems, it wouldn't necessarily be about um, establishing new law, it would be about raising these violations to, to the attention of, of the UN. I think it's valuable being in, in establishing new treaties, discussing ongoing violations of existing law, or perhaps most importantly, I share your, your cynicism of, of the UN, um, but not, um, not only because of the way it wields its power, but also because of how inactive and, and as Paul said, inefficient then the UN is. So a third potential value of initiatives such as this might be to draw attention to issues that are not currently being discussed and as um, Daniela said, raise awareness of, of an issue. Because the principle of, of accountability, it, it, it cuts both ways. It, it's not just about the, us holding the, the UN um, to, 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 to account. It's also about the, the UN giving us an account of, of what it's doing on a day-to-day on -day basis. It's about the principle of, of transparency. And if an initiative such as this it's completely successful. It goes all the way through to the point where it has a vote in the General Assembly. And then, of course, the intergovernmental nature of the system takes over. States vote on, say, a treaty. And let's say that treaty is not accepted, right? 
So the initiative was, was, was successful, but the treaty is not ultimately taken on in international law. At the very least, member states would then, I think, have an obligation to give reason. You know, member states would have the nature and the democratic legitimacy that would underpin an initiative such as this would, to my mind, establish that a duty that doesn't call it States have, have no obligation to, to explain why they vote in a certain way. But I think at the very least, states would have a duty to explain why, why they were voting in a certain way. And, and I think that has a value in itself. The UN has placed very diffuse international conflict. And that's also done by not addressing uh, certain topics, like the, the Uyghurs in the Western China, for instance, like they deliberately not talk about it. So one thing this initiative could spark is more an international conflict, for instance, if we would raise this question and the UN Council had to talk about this, which could cause, you know, tensions between America and China. It seems to me that it, it would make the, that situation, it wouldn't be the US government pushing China, and, and it wouldn't be China just using its vote on the Security Council to say, okay, this discussion's over, it would be the people of the world at least bringing this up, a vote, and it seems like the people would be more invested in saying, what is China doing blocking that? And so it's not just this problem for someone else to worry about, and we ignore it because we know it's, nothing's going to happen. If we can get people to be invested in some way in that, that they bring this forward, then it seems to me that in this particular case, China would pay more of a price as far as public opinion around the world than they would if it's all done in the UN by nation, national governments and politicians and people aren't involved. And so, it, you know, like everybody said, it's not like, boy, this solves all the problems. It really doesn't itself solve any of them. It just, it seems to me, is a chance to bring it up. And of course, there are other ways maybe we can find to bring it up. But here's one way that we could bring things up and that people could weigh in, not as governments, but as people. And I think that that would be more frightening to China in terms of their rep uh, reputation. And I can tell you, I think it would be more frightening to the United States government as far as their reputation goes. One of the reasons I really like this is that that is going to cause even greater pressure on the United Nations. The United Nations is going to fail. I mean, they just don't have the ability to do what they were envisioned to do. So a tool like this, if nothing else, could actually in some ways be a little cohesive, something that keeps the United Nations together, tries to bring people together, tries to bring greater transparency. Um, you know, but, but the reality is if the United Nations fails one day, there has to be something Mm -hmm. People need an organization or a mechanism or something to be living in the world as a, as a whole. And so if nothing else, I know I'm being kind of a crazy optimist here, that, that the starting of this could even be that it, it, even if the United Nations ceases to exist, that people have a mechanism or a tool or something to voice. Um, I mean, it's the time sky, we all know, it's going to be tough, it's going to be hard, uh, but this is how the world gets changed, and I applaud you for your efforts in I feel like you just give, you give the perfect closing remarks. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, no, I mean, I would just say, you know, my work is really focused on the European Citizens Initiative, and when I think of a tool like this, it really takes me then to the roots of the ACI, which was 20 years ago, some direct democracy uh, activists who were um, sitting around lobbying at the Convention on the Future of Europe bringing the ECI in really as a last minute effort. I mean, to really think about that, that they just, it didn't even, it didn't even make the first, the first cut. It was just a really last minute effort of, um, well, the founders of Democracy International who brought the ECI in. And uh, when you think of the, the, the legal basis of the ECI, it's a simple um, one sentence, and I don't know what exactly, but I will paraphrase that it's uh, not less than one million citizens of the EU um, can uh, propose uh, legislation to, to the European Commission that it, something that is in the um, in the um, yeah in the work of the European Commission. It's one sentence. Um, of course, there's regulation. It's the rules of the game of the ECI, but it's this one sentence then that really um, sets the stage that so many citizens can have a say in or brought them to the decision making table. And uh, this is a big idea, but sometimes it can just be broken down to this.
Uh, I just want to say that I think, you know, chances most things you try that are new and different fail. And people always tell you, you know, don't, don't let failure stop you. Uh, but nobody likes to fail. These failures, and I think Dane's on to something, if we can get people to view this as their responsibility, to see that they have a voice, even if in the end they see this didn't work, I didn't get the voice I wanted, it leads to the next step and the next step. And, and unless the people of the world take more responsibility, and demand that their governments allow them to take more responsibility, we've got ugly clouds on the horizon. Uh, in fact, some of them are raining on us right now. And uh, it seems to me that this is a step. And if it fails miserably, sometimes you know you, you win after losing. What, what is the Bob Dylan line? They won the war after losing every battle. We have to keep pushing and, and not worry that, that you know, we don't have some golden road to walk down. We'll, we'll do the best we can. Uh, yeah, just quickly, just to say, um, thanks everyone for being involved in what that's a fascinating uh, discussion. And uh, as the project uh, develops, if the organizers or if anyone has um, any questions and wants to talk through any of the more sort of technical aspects of it, I'd be more than happy to carry on any of these discussions. Um, but um, I should call up with my the saying that um, the, the praise that they um, offered there um, is due to the to, to the um, the organisations that were involved in establishing um, this idea and this initiative. And those who are represented in this room today are Daniel and Caroline. So the praise is really really generous.